Hello, this is Jacob Carter. I am the creator, writer, artist of Cotton Clad Comics, which hopefully you've checked out and hopefully you're enjoying. Uh, I, my intent is to create a variety of comic strips using traditional comic art techniques, primarily comic strips. Recently, we have done some more comic book pages uh, in some collaborations of some creative works with some friends of mine, which we're hoping to launch under a shared platform called the Creative Coalition or the Creative Nation. We're not certain on the name yet, my understanding, but hopefully we'll get there and it should be a lot of fun. So if if you're wondering why there are comic pages being posted to Cotton Clay Comics, that's why. Although they're such fun to do, I will probably continue to do that in future. But that's me. I love doing comics. I love writing comics and drawing comics and so forth. I especially love the comic strips, so I just wanted to uh, introduce myself. And what I'd like to do here is discuss not my comics, but other people's comics. Great comics which have come before, some which you may or may not be aware of. And currently I'm writing and drawing The Holy Hunchback, which I should really be posting more today. Uh, and this week I probably won't be, but it would be appropriate seeing as how it is Lent, and that would be a a good theme to run. Of course, it's more religiously oriented, explicitly religiously oriented than my other works, so it would be more appropriate to Lent, but I'm posting the pages from the uh, the collaborative effort Retropolis currently. Uh, and I will probably not post any more Holy Hunchback until that's done. But I have been trying to develop a sci-fi strip of my own science fiction, which would be a classic adventure story or adventure strip. And it, it, this has been, I've probably been thinking about doing this for about a year. And because of that, I decided to look into some other comic strips, which are science fiction. Not modern comics, but old classic comics. And I came across one, Starhawks, which is written by Gil Kane, ex- excuse me, which is drawn by Gil Kane and created and written at least for the first third of its life by Ron Goulart. Now, Starhawks ran from October 3rd, 1977 to May 2nd, 1981. If you are familiar at all with the 1970s, you'll know that uh, this was the period of Star Wars. Starhawks was actually created and submitted to syndicates prior to Star Wars. The writer Ron Goulart thought that a swashbuckling sci-fi adventure would be fun. Pitched it to the syndicate, I believe a year or a year and a half, two years before Star Wars actually came out. There it languished until Star Wars was shown to be such a hit and they decided to take a second look at it. Now there are two collections, I believe, besides some um, pocketbook paperbacks that were published in the 70s and 80s you can find and this was uh, a publishing by idw publishing in 2017 this was printed in korea and a hermes press publishing which was done in 2003 and uh, that was printed in china now i have both of these editions i have read the um, idw publishing throughout i've not read the hermes publishing version Hermes Publishing version is the complete series. So if you want to see the strip from its entirety, start to finish, 1977 to 1981, and you're on a budget, that would be a very good article to pick up. I think you can find it online for maybe $20 or $30. The IDW Publishing is about $40, and it only covers, I believe, about a year and a half of the strip. So the first six or so storylines of the strip is all it covers. However, uh, there are some strengths to it, even though it's much pricier than the Hermes Press Publishing Edition. Firstly, it is a hardback, whereas the Hermes Press Press Edition is a uh, softback. Secondly, in the IDW Publishing Edition, uh, one strip or one day's worth of art and story occupies one page. Whereas in the Hermes Press, even though they're of comparable size, IDW and the Hermes Press pages, uh, they cram four strips into a single page. So the art suffers because of that. 
The writing suffers because of that, because it's very hard to read the writing. That may seem like an unreasonable complaint, and maybe it is. Uh, for me, it was somewhat of a deal breaker, though. You want to enjoy the art and the story, but you're constantly squinting in order to read what's being said or to see what's going on in the page. But again, if you're on a budget and you want to see the strip from start to finish and you don't want to put down, what is that, $120 for a, a comic series, which I have not done yet, <laughs> to, be, uh, to be sure. I've only purchased the first volume of IDW Publishing. Um, but if you're comfortable reading that smaller print, then certainly go ahead. You can get the entire series start to finish for a you know reasonable amount, probably on a Libris or eBay or something like that. Maybe even at a used bookstore you could find a copy. I'd certainly pick it up if you find it in a used bookstore. But so the writer Ron Goulart, he was a fairly prolific pulp and comics writer. Uh, he wrote Vampirella, which many of you probably heard of. Personally, not a big fan, but big name. Also, Flash Gordon, he wrote for, for some Flash Gordon stories, which is fun. I believe he also wrote for some Marvel and DC Comics later in the 80s and 90s. So, uh, he's certainly an accomplished comic and pulp writer. Gil Kane, of course, many of you have probably heard of. A uh, very accomplished artist uh, who wrote westerns and did a lot of covers for DC and Marvel. I think he started professionally when he was about 16 working in comic shops doing comics work. So he was a very prolific, a very talented artist. Now the strip itself had some, had a unique gimmick or feature to it, which was not present in, to my knowledge, any other strip before or since. And that is that it had a two tier format for its daily strips. Now, if you're unfamiliar with comic books, you know that dailies are usually a single-tier comic with three or four panels, unless it's a gag strip on which it's one big panel. And then the Sunday strips are much larger. Usually they're two or three tiers tall. And much more expressive in art. Again, you can look back uh, you know, to the 1920s and 30s and see some absolutely beautiful artwork, which was done by artists at that time and other adventure comics in the 40s and 50s, which were just a lot of fun, which really utilized the space really well, but they're much larger, so you can do it. Well, Ron Goulart uh, and Gil Kane together, uh, you know, they, they produced this comic, which was a Sunday strip, seven days a week, which is a feat, because that's doubling Gil Kane's uh, workload every day and he was fully employed at the time he was also doing Starhawks he wanted to do a science fiction strip so he did it but uh, it's certainly an enormous amount of work for him Ron Goulart uh, again it, it would be harder to write for a Sunday strip consistently than it would a daily strip but the artist is carrying the majority of the work one would assume because comics are primarily a visual art but um, certainly it increased the workload for both of them. Interestingly enough, while many strips, excuse me, many newspapers picked up the strip, and it was popular from what I can tell, uh, I don't have the exact numbers of newspapers which picked it up, it, the two-tier format also posed to be a problem. Because, as anybody who's familiar with newspaper comics knows, the uh, newspaper page is fiercely competitive for space. So that is, you know, a finite resource which can be made available to only a few comic strips. So taking up two slots is, uh, was a big deal to editors. And many editors looking at the strip apparently did not pick it up for this very reason, because they wanted to have as much content as they could possibly pack into one page in order to draw, you know, the most viewers possible. If you could have a one-tier adventure strip and a one-tier humor strip rather than a two-tier adventure strip at the cost of having an extra humor strip, which may bring in, who knows, a, a few hundred extra subscribers to your newspaper because they really enjoy that comic strip, of course you're going to try and go with the, uh, the more diverse 
um, content. So you can grab more demographics, more people, more diverse interests. Um, so that was, while it was also a strength, it was able to, you know, showcase story, certainly art, in a way that one-tier strips could not. It also posed a problem because, again, editors were not willing, for the most part, to sacrifice that space. Now, many did. It was a popular strip. It ran from, again, 1977 to 1981, which is a pretty good run for a comic strip. Some don't last that long. Many don't last that long. And some last much longer than they should. <laughs> but uh, that that proved to be a problem. And actually, about halfway through the strip in July 1979, they terminated the two-tier aspect and reverted it to one tier. Now, I'm sure that Ron, uh, excuse me, Gil Kane was very happy with this in some ways. Again, he wouldn't be able to express his talent in ways he had hoped. At the same time, his workload was halved. So probably a relief to him in that aspect and he wasn't the person to blame for it so one of the reasons for this undoubtedly again was editors concerned but also in april of 1979 again about halfway through the strip uh, the syndicate asked ron goulart to step down and to allow another writer archie williamson to take his place now ron goulart helped create the strip and he continued to receive royalties from it he did not want to step down they felt that the writing wasn't strong enough. They wanted to have another writer come in. Archie Goodwin is, of course, a very good writer. Nobody was casting any doubts on Archie Goodwin's abilities to write. So they replaced Goulart. Volume 1 of IDW Publishing only covers the Ron Goulart period. So not able to reflect on Mr. Goodwin's writing for the rest of the strip. But the IDW Publishing covers... Six storylines, which are Nada, Dust Gun, Rebels, Hotel Maximus, The Brotherhood, and Raker's Brain. Now, some of these kind of flow together. Uh, I took the names from the Hermes Press edition, which has titles over the pages, in order to show you what the storyline is. But there are six in the volume one uh, by IDW Publishing. So, what is the strip? Well, the strip was originally actually going to be called Star Cops. So that should give you a pretty good idea of what the strip was actually about. It was about inter, an interplanetary or intergalactic law enforcement agency, which is called the Interplan Law Services. Interplan, short for interplanetary. I don't know why they just didn't say interplanetary. but And a central hub of the story is what's called the Hoosgau which is a bit of a strange name for sci-fi. Kind of sounds, you know, like paddy wagon or an old cop term. But that's the central hub of the Interplan Law Service Agency. It's a bit unclear whether or not this is the only Hooskow out there, or if there are multiple Hooskows. These are stations in space, or it may be the only station in space, which houses this, this law agency. And they receive their orders from here, the agents, and they go out and fight bad guys and investigate and stuff like that. All the things you'd expect in a swashbuckling, you know, adventure strip. There is Alice K. Binion, who is the director of the Hooskow. She's kind of a, the head of the Interplan Law Services. She is also the love interest of the main hero, who is an Interplan Law Service agent, who is... Uh, Rex Jackson, who was originally going to be called Ben Jackson, which I think would have been the stronger name, but they decided to change it to something more heroic, which was Rex Jackson, who uh, I believe it's inferred in the strip that he's the best agent the Interplan Law Services has to offer. Now, his partner, his cop buddy, is Chavez, who only has one name, and that's Chavez. He's basically a kind of like, it looks like a strong man from the circus. He's bald with a very fine mustache, and he's definitely a ladies' man. So he'll continually be distracted by women throughout the series of the strip, throughout the series, and he'll, you know, go out of his way to see and meet women. So he's, he's a funny character. He's a capable character, but he's a very funny character and kind of plays... Uh, a part in getting 
Rex into trouble and Rex has to get him out. But he's he's not incompetent. He certainly knows what he's doing, besides his one flaw, which is women. But he's a fun character. Then there's uh, Sniffer, who's my favorite character. He was also Ron Goulart's favorite character. That's basically a wise-cracking dog who believes he's superior to humans. A wise-cracking dog robot, I should say. <laughs> Um, and he has a lot of uh, fun sayings and fun exclamations. Chavez does too. He'll just stop and say, Hoy! Or Zang! Or something like that. As an, you know, as an introduction or a, an expletive or something like that. <laughs> so it, it's very fun. Some might consider that cheesy, but I kind of liked it. There's also, which is neat, and it happens very early on, a reoccurring bad guy, his name is Raker. It's a, a really cool bad guy name. He has a really cool design, sort of skeletal goblin-like. But he starts off as basically this secondary bad guy in the first story, and he becomes a reoccurring bad guy throughout the series, which is really cool. So he's not a huge threat in the first series, I mean, he tangles with the hero and all. But later on, he becomes more of a threat. So that was a pretty cool writing. So that was a pretty cool character to introduce. He is not as competent as he could be, unfortunately. But he's still a lot of fun. Which, again, it's a swashbuckling adventure comic strip. So that's what you're aiming for. Now, what are the strengths of the comic? Uh, again, the art is top-notch. Gil Kane has a very fluid art style, which is wonderful and always enjoyable to read with a lot of detail. It's a very creative world. Some aspects and names might seem a little cliche by our standards today, but it's still enjoyable to look at and pretty inventive. It also has fun, fast dialogue, which Goulart clearly enjoyed by, while writing. You can tell, uh, you know, it's got a lot of heart in it, a lot of imagination to it. Uh, d dialogue is actually one of the strengths, I'd say. Even though it's, it's very goofy at times, it doesn't make perfect sense. It, it's a lot of fun, and that's what you're expecting from an adventure comic strip. What are some of the weaknesses? Well, sometimes the plot suffers a little it can get a little choppy. One illustration of that is Chavez is fighting some bad guys. Rex is fighting some bad guys. Chavez, off panel, just destroys the bad guys. We're left wondering. Well, we're not left wondering. He explains how he did it after the fact. But he, you know, this po a problem or danger was posed to him. And we just suddenly see it's resolved. And he's kind of, you know congratulating himself on his ability to solve the problem without the viewer actually seeing what happened, which is fine. It's just it would have been more enjoyable, I think, to see it done. So uh, especially, you know, when it posed such a great danger to him and it resolves so quickly. It's almost as if somebody said this storyline is going on too far, too long. Let's wrap it up. And so they wrapped it up. Although comic strips are done ahead of time, so I don't see how that would have happened because there's so many of them, you know, months in advance of publication usually. Now, I don't know whether that was the case for this present strip, but another weakness is that the art sometimes varies in its consistency. Again, like the writing, the art is always very good, but it seemed on some days that Gil Kane was maybe putting in more of an effort than others. The line consistency and in some strips is different from it, from what it is in others. Again, that's not a big deal. Art is still top-notch. Writing is still very fun. Um, but that's something, you know, a minor critique of the comic. So the comic overall is very consistent. It's fun. It's lighthearted. It can engage in some more somber topics, darker topics. The best storyline is probably the Dust Gun, which I think is the second storyline in Volume 1. But uh, there are two characters, primary, secondary characters in that story. 
that is Zerot and Torben. And Zerot is this very tall, very sharp featured alien princess type character. Torben is this hulking uh, general who is basically Zerot's bodyguard. The character designs of both are very fun and unique. And it's a very good contrast because she's very tall and slender and, and feminine. And he's very large, hulking. Uh, but at the same time, Goulart has written him where he's a very gentle soul, a very gentle character. And uh, Gil Kane's art carries that out. So he's not somebody who wants to fight or kill unless he's forced to by necessity. Whereas Zera is somebody who's, despite her appearance, much more willing to take drastic or even immoral actions in order to further her goals, which are good goals, but she's more willing to let the ends justify the means when he is not. And the Dust Gun series, there's a very fun twist at the end, plot twist involving Torben, which I was expecting some sort of plot twist, but I wasn't expecting it to be set up like that, which is very enjoyable kind of ended in a very somber, thoughtful mood, but really well written, kind of touching. So kudos to Gallart and uh, Gil Kane for that. Strongest written series in the volume one, I think. Uh, then we have the other extreme, which is kind of light, happy, go lucky character. There's this character, Cass, who were just introduced to out of the blue, who's basically... You know, peeling potatoes in the ship's uh, kitchen. And he just decides he's going to prove himself and do something. And he gets up and he does it. And he does it well. We're not given any explanation as to how or why he's, besides the fact that he, you know, he reads or he watches videos, instructional videos and so forth. He's just good at it. It's <laughs> obviously he's a funny character. He's written to be funny and he's drawn to look a little funny. But it would have been a little helpful to have a little more explanation as to why he's so good at what he does. And he is good. He's better than some other more experienced interplan law uh, service agents. So his that storyline, I believe that was that was the Brotherhood storyline. It was fun, but uh, less less deep. I had less depth than something like the Dust Gun, but it's still a lot of fun. And it shows, I think the Dust Gun versus the Brotherhood kind of shows the two extremes. Or the not, not two extremes, but two paths that this strip, at least so far, has been able to travel with some somber, serious tones. Always mixed in with humor. It's a, it's a funny strip. But um, it's a funny strip which can engage in in somber moments. That's the best way to put it. It's a science fiction strip. You're going to expect some sort of uh, depth to the plots occasionally, and that's what happens. But it was good. I, and I'm not trying to oversell or overplay this strip. Again, it would be considered very light fare by today's standards. But it has some real meat to offer, I think, if you give it a chance. So if you have the opportunity, I would certainly pick up the primarily IDW Publishing's Volume 1 of the series, but I'll... But if you have the opportunity and you can get it cheap, go ahead and get Hermes Press's edition as well. And take a gander at Starhawk. Perhaps in future I'll review volumes two and three. But uh, for now, I think we'll call it there. And thank you so much. Hopefully I'll be talking to you all soon. I'll probably try and do these once a month. And please, you know, subscribe to Cotton Clad Comics. Take a look online. Uh, at our offerings, we have free comics available. Well, I have. <laughs> it's a one-man show. I have free comics available if you want to check out the website, cottongladcomics.com. I'm not a salesman, so I don't really do a whole lot of promotion. I don't really do a whole lot of writing and drawing, to be honest. Not as much as I should, considering how much I enjoy it. But please, if you like it, uh, just read it. That's uh, basically all we're asking. We're not charging anything. I'm not charging anything. I keep speaking in we, but I am not charging anything for the comic. I just, uh, yeah, I enjoy doing it. I hope other people enjoy reading them. And, yeah, um, give us a like, subscribe, and let us know what you think. Y'all have a, a great month, and I'll hopefully talk to y'all in April. So long.